North and South Korea are like night and day, literally. Both nations have a complicated history and geographies which shaped who they are in the present day. How are both different, and is there a chance they may reunify in the future? Let's find out. The Korean Peninsula has gone through a lot which has influenced what the area is currently. The first kingdom, according to legend, was founded by Denging in 2333 BC. Historical evidence suggests it was a powerful entity in northern Korea and Manchuria. After this, the Three Kingdoms period controlled different parts of the peninsula and were engaged in frequent warfare and cultural exchange. This period ended when Silla, one of the kingdoms, allied with Tang China and unified the peninsula for the first time in its history. By the 10th century, the Goryeo dynasty replaced Silla and it was noted for its cultural achievements. In 1392, the Joseon dynasty overthrew the Goryeo dynasty and during this more than 500 year period produced notable achievements in science, literature, and technology including the creation of the Korean alphabet. In 1897, the Joseon dynasty proclaimed itself as the Korean Empire, but this only lasted 13 years as in 1910 it fell under control of Japanese colonialism. This period lasted for 35 years until the end of World War II when the Korean Peninsula gained independence. However, it was short-lived as geopolitical differences arose. To try to resolve this, the UN came up with a plan to separate the peninsula at the 38th parallel, also geographically the 38th degree north latitude line. North of it, the Soviets would administer law, and south of it, the US would. By 1948, both Koreas became independently run, with the North becoming communist, with Kim Il-sung becoming the leader, and the South becoming democratic, electing its first president, Syngman Rhee. However, on June 25, 1950, North Korea, with the assistance from the Soviet Union, invaded South Korea, igniting the Korean War. The U.S. became more involved in the war and sent troops to help the South. The war lasted until July 27, 1953, when the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed, pretty much creating a demilitarized zone at the 38th parallel. Over the course of the last 71 years, both North and South Korea evolved differently, with North Korea remaining a communist dictatorship and South Korea slowly becoming a stable democracy. The focus of today's episode is to see how vastly different North and South Korea are. We will review it mostly as a human geographical analysis including demographics, economics, and geopolitics. Then later, we'll explore a hypothetical question on whether the Korean Peninsula can reunify one day. Before we begin, if you like geography and earth science content, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Our World, Our Planet, Our Home. Let's get started. One thing that is very similar and not different is the demographical makeup of North and South Korea. Pretty much, both nations are ethnically, genetically, and linguistically the same. The people of both nations share cultural and social attributes. In terms of demographical patterns, North Korea has a higher birth rate than death rate, 13.4 to 9.5, meaning its population is internally increasing. But South Korea has a higher death rate than birth rate, 7.3 to 7, meaning the population is internally decreasing. In addition, both nations are very homogenous, with both having very small minority populations of Chinese. This is pretty much where the similarities end. On to economics, both North and South Korea have vastly different types, with North Korea having a close centralized state economy and South Korea having a market-based mixed capitalist one. In the late 1940s, North Korea adopted communism, which made its economy exclusively controlled by the state as it still is today. While their government, along with other communist governments around the world, think it equalizes societal wealth, it hasn't produced much. The current GDP is $40 billion, and the per capita income is $1,800 a year, among the lowest in the world. Much of the economy is based off industrialization, particularly associated with manufacturing and military equipment. And since the nation is a closed economy, 
it has extremely limited export of goods, with China as its main trading partner. On the contrary, South Korea developed into a strong market-mixed capitalist economy, rapidly growing since the 1980s. It's one of the four original Asian tiger economies with Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Today, South Korea has a GDP of $2.9 trillion and a per capita income of nearly $57,000 a year, on par with wealthy European nations and Japan. Much of South Korea's economy is based on the industrial and service sectors. The nation is a large producer of value-added manufactured goods, such as automobiles, including Hyundai and Kia, and electronics, including Samsung and LG. Since these companies are multinational, South Korea has many trading partners all around the world. The geopolitics of North and South Korea are considerably different. Since 1948, North Korea has been run by a one-party hereditary dictatorship associated with the Kim dynasty. Kim Il-jung was the first leader from 1948 until his death in 1994. His son, Kim Jong-il, became the leader and remained until his death in 2011. Then, Kim Jong-un, the son and grandson of the previous dictators, became the leader and remains it today. The Kim dynasty is seen as a cult of personality within North Korea, with the citizens seeing them as eternal leaders and godlike figures. With that being said, any criticism of the dynasty is forbidden and met with extremely harsh punishment, with any government protests or jailed in one of the nation's harsh prison or hard labor camps. Also, there is no real judicial process and virtually every person accused of a crime is convicted. North Korea is ranked last or nearly last in freedom indexes. Although South Korea is considered a democracy today, it had issues. While Syngman Rae was elected in 1948, his time as president was seen as autocratic and unstable. In 1960, Rae resigned and was exiled from the nation after the April Revolution, a student-led protest caused by Rae's oppression and accusations of electoral fraud. In 1961, General Park Chung-hee seized power in a military coup and he became the president. His tenure allowed South Korea's economy to grow significantly, but he was also seen as having autocratic tendencies, and after the 1971 general election, he declared martial law, and he became pretty much a dictator. In 1979, Park was assassinated, and another coup ensued, with General Chun Doo Wan becoming the president. But he was another hardline autocratic leader. In 1987, the June Democratic Struggle Movement ultimately led to Chun resigning and choosing No Tiu as president. But this time, No chose to move the nation in a democratic direction and has been this way since. Despite this, there were notable cases of corruption with presidents, including with the impeachment and conviction of Park Won Hae, daughter of President Park Chung Hee. Many around the world wonder if reunification on the Korean Peninsula will ever occur. This prospect is something that is undoubtedly questionable. When the Korean War ended in 1953, the 38 parallel became the Korean Demilitarized Zone, a buffer between North and South Korea. Technically, both nations are still at war with each other, but it's considered a frozen conflict, one without fighting. In the last 71 years, there have been sometimes a tension, especially associated with North Korea's ambitions to produce nuclear weapons and possibly use them against South Korea and other nations. And, at other times, there has been diplomacy. In 2000, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright met with Kim Jong-il, which was seen as an early stepping stone to peaceful relations. Then, 18 years later, in 2018, President Donald Trump met with Kim Jong-un, the first time a U.S. president ever met with a North Korean leader. This meeting was praised and criticized, but nevertheless, it was historical. In the last six years, relations with North Korea have broken down, and in September 2022, the nation declared itself a nuclear state, which obviously means they're trying to produce, or have already produced, nuclear weapons. If reunification were to be considered, it's going to be a long process. For one, both North and South Korea want reunification on their own terms. 
The North has said they want to reunite the peninsula, but only if the South were to concede and become geopolitically connected to them. Of course, this concession is not going to happen. Another limitation has to do with the distinct opposites. While West and East Germany were different when reunification occurred, they were nowhere as different as North and South Korea. Most people living in North Korea are kept in secret about what goes on outside the nation, and unfortunately, many of them are brainwashed by government propaganda. If reunification did happen, where the North became democratic, it would likely take a long time for North Koreans to adjust to a free society. And some may never adjust, leading to tensions. And finally, another factor is economic disparities. North Korea is one of the poorest nations in the world, while South Korea is one of the wealthier ones. A reunification would create an overall larger GDP, but more money would have to be pumped into the Korean budget to build desperately needed infrastructural projects in the North. This would likely cost billions, if not trillions of dollars to do, creating a growing debt. And for North Koreans who want to be free and not oppressed, they may move to the richer South. This may be good and bad. Good in that it would help with South Korea's population decline issues, but bad if too many all come at once, stressing cities. Through the 21st century, change will occur on the Korean Peninsula, but what kind of change it may be is uncertain. With more geopolitical problems arising around the world, North Korea may align more so with nations such as China, Russia, and Iran. This may escalate the Korean Peninsula frozen conflict into a wider, more international one. Or, optimistically, there may be a peaceful resolution which reunifies Korea and spreads freedom to the North. Only time will tell what may happen. What do you think will happen on the Korean Peninsula? Please let me know what you think in the comments section below. Thank you once again for watching this week's episode. Remember, if you enjoy geography and earth science, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Our World, Our Planet, Our Home. Until next time!